Hey guys, so we'll start with this uh, shorter, um, smaller team. Um, and I'm gonna start from where we left off uh, last time. So um, we were going through a neural network uh, example of how the training works for a very simple network. Um, and this is what we had before. Uh, so we were uh, looking at the training algorithm here where we initialize the weights and biases. Uh, we shuffle our data. We do a for propagation, which means that we compute using this these weights and biases and the particular example we have. So we'll, we'll put some examples to our neural network. We'll compute some prediction of the neural network. Um, and then um, once we have this prediction, we calculate the difference between the neural network prediction and the desired prediction we would want to have for the particular data. We put it on neural network, then we would do a backward propagation. So you would kind of go back to the neural network and adjust. So it would be a backward move and you adjust the weights and biases um, in, the, in this neural network such that the next time we do a forward propagation, the difference between the predicted uh, value and uh, the value that, sorry, the value that the network predicts and the desired value is gonna be smaller. Uh, and then I talked a bit about the chain rule as, uh, as the kind of the tool that we'll be using to achieve this um, in, in detail. So I'm gonna come up with a very, very, very simple example here. It's a, it's, it's a degenerate kind of neural network that you, you'll never see, but it's hopefully simple enough that we can follow all the, all the steps really easily. So. Uh, in the beginning, we have an example that goes into the neural network. So this is going to be our um, input data. Remember, associated with the input data, we always, in, in supervised learning, we have a label. This input data is going to go into the neural network. So this is a single neuron neural network. And what happens here is we first apply a linear transformation. This is going to be W X1 because this, this example plus B. And then we apply uh, what's supposed to be a, a, a nonlinear transformation. So normally this would be a ReLU function or something like that. To keep the math simple, I'm gonna set this up so that it's, um, it's a one-to-one, it's, one -one, it's a linear transformation. It's just um, J of Z is equal to Z. So it, this, you'll see how the math is it's very simple here. And this is also gonna be our uh, Y this is the output of the neural network, more or less. Um, y is that. So the neural network predicts y hat. And now we are gonna calculate the loss and the loss function, we'll use the squared error. And this is for y1, actually this is y hat one. This is for the first example. So everything is kind of one here. So let's do the first example. Um, okay, so this is us kind of going through the, and this is a one neuron. To this, going to the neural network once the four propagation. Now we'd want to adjust so that this L function actually is, it's the loss, for example, one, but it's a loss that we, uh, parameterize using the WMB for this particular very simple neural network. In a, in a large neural network, you would have um, many, many values of W and many, many values of B that parameterize our loss function. Now what we want to do is we want to minimize this loss function. And we want to minimize it with respect to this W and B value. And uh, we are gonna use the chain rule to this. So the, the the goal here is when you want to minimize this function, you'll, you'll probably you'll look at the derivative and you want the derivative to be as small as possible. So you're at the next prima. Um, and the goal is to understand, to get a value that's gonna tell us how the loss changes with respect to the W and also how the loss changes with respect to this other parameter B. And We'll, we'll use the chain rule. So the first thing we do is, so this function, this loss at this particular step is uh, it's parameterized by this y hat. So what we'll get is um, we want to get 
this value. And if you just go to if you go to the math here, it would be two uh, y uh, actually I think sorry the, the order here is normally the other way around. So the y hat is the second term. So it would be two y minus um, sorry. Now I got it wrong. So it would be okay. It's a two y hat minus two y. Um, and then here we would have so this y hat in term is a function of z. So um, we'd want to get the derivative of that with respect to. So we have this, and we want to obtain. Let me put them in the same height. And we want to obtain uh, something like this. This is one. And then when we get to here, z is actually a function of w and b. And uh, if we use dz dw, this would be uh, just x1. Like that and dz db, this is uh, just one. So now if you want to compute this value here, um, so I'll just put it down here and we'll just go through the chain rule and you'll get uh, just something like this. Oops, sorry. Undo. All right, so dz. W. And we would get all these. Uh, so it would be 2y hat prediction of 1 minus 2y 1, uh, and then times. So this one, that's that. And then, then we have this one times 1. Then we have uh, dz dw, it's this one up here, um, which is x1. So this is. Uh, the gradient with respect to uh, this weight uh, for this loss. So, and then we do the same thing for um, for b, and it's going to be the same up to here, but uh, respect to b. These these give us the the gradients we have to uh, we have for these parameters such that we can adjust the weights. Sorry, if we adjust the weights, how can we minimize the loss? So um, that the loss decreases um, uh, when the next time we predict the y hat. So the next step, so we, we've done this, this particular, so the backward propagation um, consists of adjusting the weights. So right now we found the gradients and to adjust the weights, we would have the next step to be, would be, okay, for the weight uh, w, so for, sorry, for the parameter w, we'll have to take the value of the previous w and then minus some proportional, some, some factor alpha in this dl dw. And for the uh, parameter b, it will take the value of the old b minus some factor alpha and then dl db. Uh, and we just use these values that we found for, for this particular example. Um, and if we do this, the next time, so it, it is saying like if we adjust the weights such that the loss decreases, the next time we run this particular example through our neural network with the updated values of W and B, this L is going to be smaller. Um, this factor here, the alpha, is our learning rate. Um, and depending on how large it is, we would converge our faster or slower um, to some, some minima. Um, okay, so if we go into here, uh, so we, we've gone to this step and now um, we would run this for all the examples in, in our data set. And this would be kind of the training of our neural network. And if you guys have questions ask, put, put them in chat, but what I have on our um, course webpage here it's a very simple example in collaboratory that shows this. 
Um, and here, let me see, did I open it? And here you can generate, it's, it's a very simple example. You generate some data. Uh, it's a random data set. So right now it's just a, a linear data with some noise. You can add more or less, more or less points. And then uh, what, one thing I did here before I actually go into training is to plot the, the cost function associated with this data. So the cost function is, um, I'll have a very simple network. And in, in this case, uh, you'll see it fell out. Uh, the cost function here is just the, the, the loss averaged over all the examples in the data set. So what I'm doing here is I, I get my X and Y. So this is um, in, our exam, in our document here, it will be my entire da X data set and my entire Y data set. Um, and I, so I have the entire X data set and entire Y data set. I calculate a very, very simple neuron output. So this is for this particular example where the output in the end is y hat is just wx plus b. So you can see it here, wx plus b, that's my y hat. And then I, I, I sum all the predictions across the entire data, data set. These are the losses. So that's the y minus y hat. It's this thing here. For each example, I square them. And the cost is the average, average loss. And if you plot this cost function, um, for, for a particular data set, uh, you get something that looks like, and you, I parameterize it using W and B. Uh, for this particular example, you get something that looks like this. So it's a, it's a, you guys can download this notebook, copy it in your Google Drive folder and just play with it. So here I have my W parameters and my B parameters. And this is the average cost, which is the average distance between the network prediction and uh, the desired prediction if we change W and if we change B independently. Um, and we use the, 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 the examples are stay the same. So you can see how you have this um, cup shape. So this is a convex um, shape that we can now uh, traverse. So this is where we are updating Ws and Bs so that we try to reach this minima, local uh, minimum point here. And then when we reach this local minimum, this is gonna be um, where the, the, the network predicts values that are very similar to uh, the, the input data. So it's gonna be predicting values on this particular line, which if you go to the code here, is just a line of A equals five and B equals 30 of AX plus B. Very, very simple example that I hopefully is gonna give you some intuition of how this works. Um, you can also see in this particular example how if, uh, if we traverse this cup in a certain, on, on the W dimension, um, you can see how it, this is asymmetric. So you have, if the, if the learning rate on a certain dimension, it's, um, um, sorry, the, the gradient in a certain dimension is steeper than in the other. So you would traverse this particular dimension faster than this particular dimension on, on the diagonal here. Um, and this is where the optimizers come in and they try to optimize the learning rate such that uh, for one dimension, it's gonna be uh, just as efficient. Uh, so this learning rate here, we want that to be optimal for both these parameters in this very simple case. In, uh, in very complex networks, you'll have a billions of these parameters. So the optimizer will have to be able to deal with these n dimensional, like billion dimensional spaces. And we don't really, we can't really see them fairly well. We can imagine them. Uh, so this is the calculate the cost function. If you go through this notebook, uh, I train uh, this network, neural network by hand here. So uh, this is a forward pass. Actually, this is the, the reverse or the backward pass, backward propagation. And in the backward propagation, I just um, calculate the losses and the derivatives. And this, these are the derivatives that I calculated in here. I just put them in here and then I update my weights and biases. And then uh, this is one pass through one uh, example. And then what I do is I train on the entire data set here. Um, every time I train, I am gonna shuffle the data. So uh, remember, 
uh, in this step here. We have to shuffle the data every time you train. If not, you are going to introduce a certain, it, it's the learning is going to be much, much slower and you might not converge on the right minima and more complex data sets. Um, and then you can see how this is this kind of the, how when you run this exam, this particular notebook, um, you can see how the law starts. Um, what is going, oh, here, this is already trained. So the loss is right now just kind of bouncing up and down between two values. But you will see the loss starts at a very high value, which is about, I don't know, thousands. And then it's slow, it's, it's converging to a lower and lower value. And then the weights and biases here um, are going to start converging on, oh, shoot, come on. Are going to start converging on these uh, values A of five and B of 30. Um, the, the interesting bit, as I said, because um, the, 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 on the B dimension, the loss is uh, not as steep, we would be moving towards that minima on, on, in the B dimension much slower. Um, so here, when you look at the Ws, the Ws have already kind of are very close to uh, the value that we want, which is five, but our bias uh, term here, the other uh, parameter of our network is, is this, needs, this needs to go to 30. So it still has quite a bit um, um, to be, to move on the gradient. So this is a neural network kind of implemented by hand. Uh, well, ne not neural network, it's a neuron implemented by hand. Um, and then I also do it down here um, using TensorFlow and KRAS. So these are frameworks that have been uh, put together to take advantage of um, the graphic processing units on computers and they run all these operations in parallel so they're much much faster than running them on running these operational cpu it's a, again a very very simple network exactly like the one above uh, you can just kind of get a feel for how it looks so when when you implement it with uh, kras and tensorflow and when when you run that this particular training uh, on the network, you will get something that looks like this, um, where the, the neural network prediction is in this dashed line. This red line is I actually ran, oh, I also have code to run a least square uh, optimization using kind of, have you guys done this in Math 200, uh, where you estimate the coefficients least square fit? Um, this is kind of old school kind of, linear regressions. Not sure if you guys did it or not. Uh, all right, perfect. Um, so I I've, I've put this in here just to show, okay, this is what, this is kind of the optimal. When you reach that, uh, that minima, this is what you would get using a traditional regression. This is how the network kind of slowly is converging on that. Um, the, the training and validation example here, we'll, we'll cover this in next week. Um, it's, uh, it's about, trying to prevent the network from overfitting, uh, but yeah. Uh, all right, so going back to our slides here. Um, this would be about it for, for the math. Hopefully I'll, I'll put the, this notebook uh, on, in the lecture notes, like next to the lecture notes in the, on the course website. You guys can take a look at it. Hopefully, it makes sense. I sorry. I when when I went through the video, I realized that some of the values I put in here for the um, this was the binary cross entropy. I think they were a bit uh, there were some mistakes here, and I tried to correct them. But these will be available on the course website. So if you guys need to go to this, you can. I don't. No, if it's that difficult, but I just wanted you guys to have a feel for how the neural networks kind of adjust these uh, parameters so that the output is uh, converging towards the desired output. So uh, now we are going to kind of go back to our normally scheduled program and we'll be talking about the convolutional neural network. So we are just changing pace here quite a bit. Um, don't know if you guys have done convolution, uh, maybe you have, or this semester or next semester, I'm not sure when you guys are covering that, or Fourier transforms. Um, if you want, I, I found that uh, certain books are very math heavy, and I don't know if they provide a 
a strong intuition for how uh, Fourier transform and convolutions work. Um, from me kind of digging around, I found this, the, the scientist guide, the scientist and engineer's guide to digital signal processing book to be a very applicable uh, book for this type of um, analysis and kind of applications. And it's a, it's a free book. You guys can click on the link here and kind of take a read of, through it. Um, I, uh, yeah, I recommend it to anyone who's interested in uh, DSP and similar kind of techniques. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of one of my, let's say top three books in, in engineering that I kind of recommend to others. Um, all right, talk a bit about, so before we go into convolution neural networks, I just wanna make sure everybody's kind of on the same page regarding convolution. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys, if you, you understand kind of how this uh, particular result here with the, the black line is um, generated when you apply convolution, you're like 221. Okay. Uh, you are sweeping one function over another and um, you're taking uh, the integral of that. You're, you're summing up that result. So you can see the, the overlap here is these two functions kind of start overlapping that that area is the result of the convolution and you get the maxima when the functions these functions kind of overlap uh, perfectly um in so this is kind of a, a visual intuition of what the uh, what the how the math works out the math itself uh, in for digital uh, data so this is uh, this would be let's say a continuous data uh, for digital data, the way you, you do this is, so this kernel function is the, the function that's sweeping. So let's say it's this red function. And uh, as we sweep it across our, um, I guess we call, would call this a template, um, you would um, multiply each term in the kernel with kind of its respective term in the template, this array. And then uh, for the first element here, so it would be kind of the first value here, would go w1 times a w plus uh, w2 times b plus w3 times c and that would be the value of the first term so it's kind of the, the integral here or sorry the surface there uh, and then you you continue kind of uh, sweeping this kernel across this array so then you move the the kernel down one and then you apply this operation again and again and again and you get this result um, this is the convolution result um, another way I think about this uh, convolution process is uh, to shift everything in frequency domain. And in frequency domain, convolution is uh, reflected by an, a multiplication operation. And in the frequency domain, I think this is going to allow for a much better intuition of what we are do, trying to do with the, the result of the convolution. So because in frequency domain, the, the convolution is a multiplication, if we have two um, functions that we, we multiply, uh, what we are doing is we are masking the, the frequency uh, response of one function with the frequency of the other function. Um, so in this case, what I'm, I guess I'm, I'm showing here is, so let's say this function is just two sinusoids of two different frequencies. In frequency domain, you would have these two different frequencies. Um, and then if I multiply this particular function uh, up here by this other function down here, which is just one of the sin, it's one of the sinusoids. If you multiply this by that, um, it's, a, it's a kind of one by one multiplication, this higher frequency component disappears. So what I'm actually doing, so if you imagine multiplying this by this, the result is gonna be something that's gonna look like this. And what I've, uh, effectively done is low pass filter, or in this case, or it's band pass filter, this particular input uh, signal so that it matches the, the signals in this, uh, in this other, uh, sorry, the frequencies in this other signal. So we, I, am, I am creating these filters that um, the kernels are these, the filters that uh, we apply to some, our image and, these filters are going to just allow certain frequencies to propagate into the next step. Hopefully this intuition is going to come in handy when we talk about images in the next few slides. Um, so this is in one dimension. In two dimension, it's a very similar sequence of 
steps that we do. It's, it's a bit more complicated just because we have two dimensions, but overall it's kind of the same idea where you'll have a, a, a particular uh, position in your input array. You have this kernel now, so our kernel is also two dimensional. And uh, let's say we are up here. So you multiply this weight by this array, by this value here, A, and this weight by this B, weight three by E and weight four by F. And then you sum all of them. And that sum uh, is now taking um, the, it's, we are gonna assign it this particular up uh, value in the corner here in the, the output. The, in, in uh, the um, standard uh, neural networks, the weights and biases were, were part of the neuron. Now, or the, the unit, that we had there that we call the neuron. Now for the convolutional neural networks, the weights and biases are, so the weights are part of the kernel and you'll see how the bias, the biases are just a term that uh, we add to this particular sum here. So these weight, these Ws are the values, the parameters that we are gonna adjust such that our network, the, the, the weights in the kernel, such that our network is gonna output the desired result that's closer to the desired results. Um, Okay, so this is this is how convolution works in 2D. Uh, to uh, again try to give you a, a, an intuition for how um, these kernels affect the results. So I said that these kernels somehow filter the frequencies of the images that are present in the image. Uh, I don't know how many of you know of this website. I, I find it a bit, it's being referenced. Oh, can you guys still hear me? No. Oh man, I hope uh, I hope the Zoom recording is okay. Okay, so if you are a bit better, okay. Um, so this is a website put together uh, by a few um, edu educators, and the really cool part is that it 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 provides kind of uh, one to one, uh, real time um, description of what what's happening here. So you can see this image on on the left here. Um, I if I move my mouse. Uh, over it, you can see the actual values. This is the, this is the array, and you guys can go to this website and play around with it. Um, that are associated with this grayscale image, and then you you can select a particular kernel to convolve this image with. And depending on what kernel we apply, you will have different types of uh, results. So um, the blur is the the standard Gaussian kernel, and in this case, what we are doing is the the Gaussian in, in the frequency domain, it's just going to be a low pass filter. So it's going to allow all frequencies um, that are. So if you imagine, if we were to look at the frequency domain here, it will allow all lower frequencies to pass and it would, um, it would kind of cut off on the higher frequencies. Um, so the resulting image, after you apply the, 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 the blur kernel to the image, you can see how it's much blurrier here. And uh, with this example, you can, you can see the kernel is in the squares on the left-hand side here. So if I move my arrow, it's right here. That's the kernel. And I put the kernel over any pixel in this image. And you can see how in the middle section there, there's the convolution process. Uh, it's what we showed in the previous slides where I am multiplying each element of the kernel with the neighborhood of the pixels around where my kernel is right now in the image. And then you'll see the result there is 134. And that's what's being shown in the right image, the result of the convolution. And you guys can select different kernels here. So some of them are allow us to highlight uh, uh, lines. So this is transitions from dark to bright or from bright to dark uh, here. So this is one of them. So this is a Sobel kernel that uh, highlights transitions from bright to dark, kind of going from left to right. Uh, and you can see here, so this is on, on the left-hand side here, when you go from um, bright to dark, that particular section is highlighted. Um, so certain frequencies are highlighted. And uh, yeah, just if you, if you wanna play around with it, to get a better intuition of how convolution works. I think this is a very good uh, website. Um, okay, so we have it there. So now to give you an idea of, um, how we can create a filter. Um, so for example, if we want to find this line here, this vertical line here, 
uh, this is the Sobol filter I was just showing you guys. Uh, so this is our input image. We have a kernel that looks like this. So something, some very high value, uh, lower value and a very low value. And if you convolve this kernel with this image, we are gonna highlight this region in the center here that we have the transition. And this is how the result looks like. Um, so different components of the image have different um, representations in the frequency space. This is what I'm trying to show with this image. Take a Fourier transform uh, of this image, you'll get something like this. And then these different frequencies in the Fourier transform kind of highlight different features in the image. And what the neural networks do is they, uh, the convolution neural networks, they uh, filter the input images kind of in, in a sequential fashion such that the resulting, the resultant, um, output of all these different filters is going to allow us to predict the, the output that we want. So I don't know, cat, no cat or something like that. Um, and this is, this is kind of one example here. So this is, this would be a neural network that recognizes faces. So uh, you would put an image. So to tell you, okay, you have a face or you don't have a face in this image. So you'd put an image into your neural network. And then at each step here, you would apply a convolution uh, uh, operation. And as you'll apply more and more convolutional operations, and at some point, actually after this step, what we do is we, own, um, it's called flattening. We take this, the resulting image that's being processed and we just un unfurl it, unroll it. So from instead of having a, W or a, a height by width by a certain number of channels. Now we have a single dimensional array that's been unrolled. Um, and then we, we run a few more uh, standard uh, multi-layer perceptrons. So this is, this is the standard fully connected layer neural network units. And then uh, we, we get our result. Um, and then if, if you, we are to interpret how the, the kernels, the, the network as it's training, it's adjusting each kernel such that the result of this particular sequence of transformation is our desired result. So let's say it's an image or not, it's a face or not. But as we adjust the kernels, each kernel now is gonna be um, filtering certain features uh, out of the, or into the image. It's gonna allow certain types of features into, to, to kind of propagate through this, this network. And if we were to look at what type of features at the different uh, se sections of the neural network are allowed to propagate, we observe this um, progression from very simple features uh, early in the neural network that, are, uh, that these kernels detect to more and more complex features uh, deeper into the neural, as we go deeper into the neural network. So the, as, uh, as a result of the training process, the neural network will uh, learn how to understand kind of very simple shapes in the first few layers. And then it's gonna combine these shapes into more, more complex features. So you can see here the lines and in different directions, the circles and whatnot. And then these are being combined into kernels that can recognize more complex features in the input image. And then these more complex features are Kind of assembled in a way by the layer, by the these deeper uh, layers in in kind of the phase that we want, and then if this particular set of frequencies is being activated, then we say, okay, we have a a, a phase in the image. Um, so th this is again an intuition for how the convolutional neural networks process the images, and it does match uh, fairly closely the way we understand the human brain processes images. So if you take visual stimuli from the eye and you kind of uh, propagate them through the brain, we observe that uh, in, in early layers in the, in the brain, we detect very simple features. And then as we go further and further deeper into the brain, uh, more and more complex features are being uh, discerned by our brain. So it's an interesting observation here. Um, so for this particular um, neural network, we'll, we'll go a bit more into, into how it works. Um, the, the idea is, let's say we, instead of faces, it's, it's gonna be something that we'll work in the lab with. Let's say you have an image and you want to look at uh, 
trying to figure out if uh, there's a num or numbers or letters in that image. So you want to figure out if it's a, a letter A to Z or the digit zero to nine in the image. So as an input, we have these um, images that are 32 pixels by 32 pixels and then RGB, so red, green, blue channels. So that's, this is kind of the, the dimension of the images here. And then we pass these images through a sequence of convolutional operations. And then the way these convolutional operations are denoted by is using, uh, so this is shorthand in a way. So we have uh, the kernels uh, size is five by five. We'll, we'll talk about more about this in the next slide. The stride of the convolution is one and we'll talk about what stride means. Then actually here we have eight kernels that we want to learn. So um, it's kind of eight different, if you were to think about this, it's kind of eight different types of frequencies that we would want to filter out. Um, and then, uh, so this is one convolution, then there's this pooling layer and we'll talk about what pooling layer means in a sec. Um, and then there's this another convolution, another pooling layer. And this in, in, in standard practice, this particular sequence of applying a convolution in the pooling, a convolution in pooling um, is done a lot. And um, another observation, so we have these pairs of convolution pooling that are uh, daisy chained. Another observation is that we start with a fairly large image with few channels. So uh, 32 by 32 by three. And the deeper into the network we go, it will, will reduce this the size of the image, but what we do is we increase the number of um, channels, which are uh, indicative of how many filters we use um, as, as we progress the network. So you can see how the, the actual size of the image here, so from 32 to 32, we go down to about five by five, but then um, the number of filters we are taking account is increasing. So it goes from eight to 16 in this very simple example. Um, so once we, we've reached this stage and there's no, there's no hard rules about how many times you have to apply this or it's kind of a very empirical science where you'll just try it, see if it works or not. Then you look at the output and be like, okay, does the network seem to learn? It does, or if it doesn't, let me add some more layers to try to capture the, the pattern, the data. So once you've reached this layer here, uh, where you have 15 by five by five by 16, um, so 400 pixels here, um, we'll, sorry, 400 values, we would un flatten them, so unroll them and create this, um, this single dimensional um, layer. And then here you would just have fully connected layers. So each unit in here is connected to each other unit in the next layer. We have three of these fully connected layers and then we have a soft max uh, layer at the end. This is gonna allow us to um, do uh, categorical um, classification. Uh, so we, in this case, let's say this is only for images recognizing if you have a, a digit in your image. So we only have 10 outputs. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll come back to this to kind of go through how we can understand the, the size of the network here. So to, to solidify the understanding, uh, the, this input image here, I'll, I'll keep it a bit smaller. So instead of 32 by I'm sorry, instead of 32 by 32 by three, I'll just have it as a six by six by three. So the, the three here represents the three color channels. And this would be, uh, so I'm gonna just go through one step of convolution here, just to give you guys an idea. Uh, this would be the input. And then we would convolve it with, so here I have two filters. Uh, for each filter, I have a kernel that's associated with uh, a channel in the input of this particular convolution uh, step. So I have two filters and then in each filter I have three, uh, three kernels. And the, here, it, this is where we have our, um, our W. So our weights that parameterize our loss functions are in these kernels here. Uh, so for the red channel, I'll multiply it with this particular kernel. For the green channel, I'll multiply it by the next one. For the blue channel, I'll multiply it by the next one. Um, and then what I do is I sum up all the results of all these convolutions into a single. So I sum up this value with this value with this value into a single um, uh, into a single number. Actually, it's not these values. It's going to be the, the the resulting the convolution result of this these channels multiplied by these kernels. 
So I'm going to get this uh, four by four. This is the convolution result. So if you if you convolve a six by six input image with a three by three kernel, you'll get a four by four uh, convolution result. Um, so I'm going to sum these up and put them in this array. To, in this array, I'm going to add my bias term. Um, and then this is going to be one of my output uh, of my output filters. And then I do the same thing for this other output filter. And these are going to be adjusted. The weights and biases for this filter and this filter are going to be adjusted independently. We can imagine these filters. Uh, so let's say the top filter, this is what I'm trying to say here is, is detecting vertical lines in your in your input image and the bottom filter is detecting horizontal lines in your input image so what we want to do is um, for particular desired output we want to adjust the weights of the of this of these kernels such that this particular filter is going to uh, detect is going to allow only frequencies that are for horizontal lines to pass through and this particular filter would allow only frequencies that are for vertical lines to pass through uh, and it's it's not like the the design the human designer uh, just these particular weights and biases. It's just that the network during its training process uh, result the training process results in these kernels now detecting those types of uh, those types of images. So it's it's these types of images here in the early early the early layers of the network. Um, so hopefully now you if. if We'll, we'll just kind of go through and the, the values here to try to understand what's happening. So the input layer for, we'll just go through a few of the layers here. The input layer is this 32 by 32 by three. So this is what we call it the activation shape. So it's the, the activations A0 that go into our network are kind of uh, these values here. Um, the, the activation size here is, um, um, the I guess in, in layer zero you would get how many how many outputs do you, do you have, uh, and in this particular case it's just uh, the thirty two by thirty two by three uh, multiply all these values and you get three thousand seventy two. So those those three thousand seventy two values go into this convolution layer here, and they go in in this particular uh, format. And now if you the out of this layer here. Um, We'll have six thousand values coming out. So we, the, if you um, multiply these values here, uh, so this is uh, sorry, it's it's the it's going to be four by four by two, or in our case, it's going to be twenty-eight by twenty-eight by eight. Um, so it's these uh, uh, values here that are the activation. Um, uh, the activation size for this particular layer. So these are the outputs of this particular layer. You have 6,000 values. And the parameters here are, imagine it's these values here. So it's, it's uh, the size of a kernel times how many kernels we have for each input channel here. And then for each one of these kernels, we have uh, a bias term that we add to the kernels. So in this case, it would be something like, um, Let's see. So um, this has three channels, and then we use a kernel size of five by five. So it's three times five by five um, plus um, so 50, uh, three, 75 uh, plus one bias per kernel. So it's 76 times eight, uh, eight kernels that we have. So it's uh, what I'm what I did here was. I have three kernels as an input, um, and sorry, three layers as an input, and the kernel per layer. And each kernel is you now in the previous example, it was five by five times three, so that's the 75 plus one bias term, 76. And then I have eight filters, so you can imagine eight of these uh, so yellow color, green color, orange color, green color, and whatnot. So it's 76 times eight, and that's the number of parameters, this 608, I guess, uh, parameters in this particular convolution layer. And this 608 parameters are the number of parameters we need to adjust. We need the neural network to adjust. And the, the size of the neural network is going to be determined by how many parameters you have in it. And for very large 
neural networks, you'll need a lot of time to uh, train them. And you also need a lot of data to adjust all these parameters. Um, OK, so th th this makes sense a bit. It's, uh, I'm not sure if, if you guys are following. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read in chat here, hopefully. And OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going here. So um, we could use, we don't need to use neural, uh, convolutional neural networks for determining if there's a certain uh, desired um, particular value in the, in the image that we have. We could use just standard uh, fully connected neural networks. And this is, I think, what uh, three blue, one brown does. He has a, a fully connected neural network in his examples. Uh, the advantages of using a convolutional neural network instead of a fully connected neural network is that we can decrease the numbers, the number of parameters um, uh, associated with this particular model dramatically and still be able to uh, identify features in the image. And uh, I'm trying to convey the intuition here uh, for why we can do this is, um, let's say in, in, uh, in our model, we have uh, two layers and from one layer, we, we want to connect it with a fully connected uh, type of neural network. And then the, another model, we have um, two layers and we are gonna connect them with a convolution operation. So if we use the fully connected uh, model, um, let's say these are our two layers. So one layer has 3000 parameters, is, uh, sorry, 3000 input values. And then um, it needs to connect to this other uh, layer that has 4,000, sorry, uh, 3,000 output, output values and uh, 4,000 input values. So you can imagine you have 3,000 neurons uh, in this layer and then 4,000 neurons in this layer. Um, and if you want to have a fully connected neural network that uh, it reflects this, for each connection here, uh, for each node here, you'd have to connect to 4,700 nodes on the other side. So you'd have a, param a weight parameter associated with each one of these connections. In the end, you'll need 4 million parameters. So it's this, this particular multiplication here. And this would allow you to tell, to say something about, well, if uh, let's say you're trying to detect a cat, um, if I need to detect a cat and the cat is at the top left corner here, those first few neurons, when I unroll the image, are going to be uh, containing information about the cat. So I need to be able to process these neurons in a certain way so that these next neurons are going to slowly allow me to say that I have a cat there. And then if the cat is in the bottom left of the image, these, these neurons at the bottom here need to be processed in a certain way. So the weights associated with these bottom neurons are going to be modified to detect that there's a cat. And you can see how if the cat, if you have the exact same image of a cat at the top of the net of the image and at the bottom of the image, we actually have to train different set of weights. We have to adjust different set of weights to detect the same image, to detect the same pattern. With the convolutional neural network, on the other hand, because the kernel is sweep, swept across the image, and the kernel is the uh, component that contains the weights. If the kernel detects an image, so it's, it, it's able to identify an image in the top left corner here, because the, we use the same kernel throughout the image, so the same weights throughout the image, uh, we can also detect the cat in the bottom right in, uh, of the image here. Um, and uh, the intuition is that you, because the kernel is uh, much, uh, it has fewer parameters that it needs to keep track of, with the same, uh, and we share it across the different regions of the image, uh, we, we can have the same uh, robustness or the same kind of accuracy with many, many fewer parameters. So in this case, for this particular type of like a five by five kernel uh, and six filters, let's say that you would use to identify a cat, uh, you would only need 156 parameters instead of 40 million. So the, the, because you have fewer parameters, we need less data to uh, optimize these parameters. And we also uh, need um, a, a shorter amount of training to uh, train this neural network. So even though we can uh, use the multi-layer uh, perceptron, so the fully connected model uh, to do the exact same, uh, let's say processing of the data using a convolutional network, it's much more efficient. Um, this is why people seem to use them. 
And there's a, so this was convolution generators were kind of at the forefront of image processing until fairly recently. So probably until um, a year ago or something like that. And now we have, um, there's these uh, transformer types of neural networks that seem to be able to um, perform probably just as well as convolution neural networks, but they use a different type of architecture. So um, yeah, the, the, the field is advancing quite rapidly. So we'll see how, what happens in the next two years or so. Uh, so talking a bit more about the, the, how, neural net, how the neural network convolution works, um, and this is what I'm going to cover. So when, when I went through the example here, I talked about uh, stride, stride of one and pooling. So we'll go through what these terms mean. So the stride refers to how um, closely spaced the convolution operations occur. So you could have a stride of one, and it means that we are going to apply the convolution operation for every adjacent pixels in the input image. You can see how the, the convolution kernel is kind of sweeped here across each pixel one by one. If you have a stride of two, um, you, you will apply the convolution process uh, every other pixel. So you would you'll have the convolution kernel is going to be processed for uh, this particular set of pixels, and then we are going to skip one, and then we are going to apply for these ones. Um, uh, the idea here is if the image is fairly um, high resolution, so the, the different um, local components of the the information, the local component doesn't change much across the image. You can actually jump around and kind of just sample from that image uh, at, the, at the more kind of um, the further distance without losing a lot of information. And this allows us to uh, train the network faster. Um, so, and we, uh, we, yeah, we require less space to keep track of all the, the values here. So it's, 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 we need less compute um, for, for uh, training a network if we, if we use this stride operation. Um, similarly, um, when we, oh, so this is, the pooling is also gonna help with that. Um, this is a problem we have when you apply convolution, not, not only for neural networks, it's, it's convolution at large. Um, if you're, you have edge effects, so as, when you try to run the convolution kernel on pixels that are at the edge of your image, uh, some pixels will be undefined. And uh, uh, a lot of times what this results in is in the output image kind of shrinking. Um, you can uh, maintain the size of the image by padding the, the input image with some pixels that are, let's say you want them not to affect the result much. So they'll, you'll want them to have the average value of the image. Um, or you can, yeah, you, uh, you can set them to zero. There's different techniques here to pad the image. Um, in, in, in a lot of cases, uh, so in, in our case here, we didn't pad the image and this is why we shrunk from 32 by 32 to 28 by 28. And uh, the amount of shrinking you get is, uh, it, it, it's uh, reflected by this operation. And if we don't want to get shrinking, we have to pad the image and we have to pad it by this many pixels here. Um, in this case, so you, set, you can set them to zero here, for example. Um, so you, in KRAS and these uh, other frameworks that we, in PyTorch and TensorFlow, you can specify when you have a convolution layer, whether you want to pad your image or not. And if you pad it, it means that the uh, output is not gonna decrease in size. So it's gonna stay the same size. Um, Another technique here, and you saw it when, when we talked about the architecture here is every other step in a convolutional neural network in the convolution part is um, uh, a pooling step. And what the pooling step does is um, gonna extract the highest value um, of, the, of, of, an, of a convolution result. And it's gonna only keep it, is, it's gonna keep that value as representative for this uh, particular region of the image. Uh, so here we have uh, four images. So this is going to result in a, a shrinking of the of the input by a factor of two. So uh, for each one of these regions, uh, we are only going to store the highest value. So uh, for this region, the value is nine. For this region, the value is two. Um, then you have six and uh, three in here. This is the resulting image here. So um, if you were to think about um, each convolution output now is 
uh, the result the resulting um, the result of applying a particular filter and let's say we have a filter that detects eyes um, the, the filter when you apply the filter to detect eyes you can see in the image uh, this particular pixel um, is high it has a high likelihood that it's an eye so in, in this particular uh, location in the image I would want to know that I have an eye there I don't really care about the other the adjacent pixels and those might somehow indicate I don't know the eyelashes in the eye or some 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 very high detail features of the eye I'm just going to keep the the information that's related to the the fact that I have an eye here and if you are only looking at these high values you could say oh I have an eye here and then maybe I have an eye on this side too and if you are trying to detect a face you might have some other filter down the road that says if you see two eyes next to each other uh, that's a high likelihood of having a face or maybe you combine that information with the fact that maybe you have another field that detects noses so you can see okay if you see two high values that reflect eyes and then uh, next to them is a high value that reflect that indicates a nose that might be a, a representation of a face you don't really care that the nose is big or small or whatnot you care the, about the location of the nose with respect to the eyes in terms of figuring out if the image you're looking at contains the the patterns that you would you you are looking for and the, the fact that you we are able to reduce the the high level features to just a simple feature allows us again to um, speed up the computation and also require less size in, in memory that uh, to have our, our network be represented as. So these are these are patterns that were developed um, by over many years to make us a, be able to develop to train these models because before if you wouldn't have these max pooling layers in between it would take a very long time to train these neural networks and it was, it was infeasible to use them. Um, so th this is this is kind of the, the, the intuition between the max pooling so the max pooling is abstracting away features um, from the image and it's, it's giving kind of a low representation of those features um, so more or less this is kind of all all you would need to know to build a, a convolutional neural network and just give you an example how easy it is to do this with the current frameworks and this is this is where i think anybody can train a neural network now it's much more about um how do you troubleshoot how a network performs and how do you um actually prepare the data to, to train a neural network that's where the brunt of the work is uh, the training and kind of setting up the neural network is a, a few lines of code and this is an example and in uh, so the, the most of the work you guys will do is in preparing and creating generating data and um, manipulating the input data the actual definition of the model you can see it, it's here and this this is reflecting uh think this model here so what we have is is an input image we have a 32 um uh sorry the, the input okay so the input image is not 32 by 32 it's the it's a, a 128 by 128 pixels it's a square image with three channels and then what we do is we apply to this input image um, a convolutional uh, layer and the layer has 32 filters and each filter is a three by three kernel and then the activation here for this filter is relu so the activation um, we apply it um, when after we after we uh, sum up the result of the convolutions and we add the bias we apply the relu operation this is the activation to that output um, matrix for each filter uh, so here we say, okay, we have a relu activation, um, and then the result of this layer is going to be piped into this next layer, which is a pooling layer, a two by two pooling layer. So this is going to reduce the size of the image by a factor of two. And then we do another convolution layer, another pooling layer, then we flatten the image. Then we apply this dropout layer, and we'll talk about what dropout does in the, in the next lecture. It's a way to prevent overfitting. Um, and then this flattened layer, we connect it to the next layer, which is just 512 neurons. And then at the end here, we have uh, an, an output layer that has two neurons and the activation for those two neurons is soft max. This is a 
we are, it's going to allow us to say we have two classes, it's a dog or a cat, and uh, um, the output is going to be okay, it's, it's either a value, a high um, value for the first neuron means a cat, it's a, it's a high value for the other neuron, for the second neuron, it's a dog or something like that. So this is, this is creating the architecture of the network. Then to train, uh, we also have to specify um, how the training algorithm is going to work. And we, here we specify the learning rate. So this is the, that alpha term in, our, in, the, in the math that we were covering here. So it's how fast the weights are going to be uh, adjusted uh, with respect to the, the derivatives that we find. Uh, so that's our learning rate. We also use, uh, we'll, we'll specify what loss we are going to use. In this case, it's, uh, it's binary cross entropy. Uh, when we looked at the math here, we just had a, a squared, a mean squared error here. The, this was the, the loss. Um, and then this is the, op, what optimizer we're going to use. So remember, traversing the different dimensions might uh, cause us to go very slowly in one dimension and very fast in another dimension. So the optimizer is trying to optimize the traversal of that cost parameter space so that we move, we, we move, it, move through it fairly quickly. Um, and then the, the metric here, uh, instead of, so the metric is accuracy here in this case. So the accuracy is uh, reflecting how many answers we got right versus the total number of answers. And this is, uh, this is gonna give us a better intuition on how well our network performs uh, compared to the loss. Because the loss, it's, you can't really interpret what a loss of a thousand means. Uh, you could interpret what, I don't know, 90% accuracy means. So in this case, what, what this does is, as the, the model is training, we'll output the loss, but we'll also output after each training step, the accuracy that the network has improved by or not improved by. So this, this in the end, so we have the network architecture. This is the training parameters or the training uh, format. And then uh, to train the network, we just run this function fit for a KRAS framework. And in the function fit, you would put the, uh, X data sets, so these are more inputs and the desired labels, the desired outputs that we want for this particular X data set. Uh, we'll talk about the validation split in, in the next lecture. Then here we say how many times we want to traverse um, the, the entire data set. So we want to traverse the data set 20 times. Um, and then uh, uh, there is the, the concept of a mini batch descent. So um, when you traverse, when you train the network, you want to train it for every 16 um, forward passes, you average the, the cost function for 16 examples, and then you do a backward pass to update the parameters in the network. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So this was, we, th we talked about this, uh, I think on, on Monday or uh, a week ago. I'll, I'll, I'll try to touch upon this again when we, when we go to the lab. Um, so, this is it. So you run this particular function and then you let it train. You'll get a model at the end. So this is the convolution model you get. And then you can just all call conv model.predict and it's gonna just predict, it's gonna start inferring the data, whatever you pass in some data and it's gonna try to predict what's in that data. So from a building a neural network type, a neural network point of view, it's, uh, it's very easy to do it nowadays. Um, the for convolutional neural networks we talked about very simple a very simple neural network uh, there's more complex networks that have come uh, that were developed since then uh, there's these uh, residual neural networks where uh, certain activations so certain outputs of uh, layers in the neural network are being passed deeper into into a network uh, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, the problem of vanishing gradients um, in, in the next lecture, and hopefully this is gonna become clear what ResNet does. Um, you only look once, this, is a, this was kind of a workhorse uh, neural network that was used by a lot of uh, people for a while. This has now become more or less obsolete. Uh, there's, there's quite a few more powerful neural networks uh, that allow us, for example, to do semantic segmentation here. So um, I think I, I talked about this, how um, you put in an input image, the network, in, in its processing, abstracts certain features out of the network, um, out, of, out of the input image. 
and then it, it generates an output image that allows you to identify for each pixel in the input image what class uh, this particular pixel is in. And so you can imagine here how um, is that as, the, as we progress the network here up to the middle of the network, we are abstracting features away. So it's going to be like, okay, so certain features here are grass, certain features are cows, certain features are sky, certain features are trees. And then we, this is kind of the, the highest level of, the, of abstraction that the neural network reaches. And then from here on, it actually, it's no longer uh, extracting features away, it's generating features. So this is a, a generative uh, section of the neural network. And it's gonna generate the pixel, the class um, for each pixel that is generating is gonna associate with a certain class. So in this case, this is green, it's grass, pink is trees, brown is cows and blue is sky. Uh, these are these are very powerful uh, type of models, and this is kind of how, let's say, deep fakes kind of also work. Um, so you you try to create these generative artificial networks that are uh, generating a certain uh, image from this uh, latent space from this abstraction, and you want to make sure that your abstraction is actually capturing the dimensions of the image that you are interested in. Uh, we'll, we'll probably cover this in some other lectures, but as you can see, the, um, the simple steps of convolutions have been refined into these very advanced networks. So um, it's, it's, it's becoming kind of uh, very magical in its, in these models are becoming very powerful in their, their abilities. Um, this is kind of it for neural networks. Uh, in, in the lab five, you'll just build a simple neural network to classify license plates. Uh, hopefully that's also gonna allow you to develop stronger intuitions for um, how, how neural networks kind of work. Is there any questions or you can, I'm gonna go to this last slide here. Um, okay, so there are no questions that this is kind of this week's moment of Zen. Um, and I wanted to kind of bring some some perspective on the the the, the equivalence between these type of neural networks and kind of how we our brain works. And uh, one one cool uh, observation is that uh, certain um, illusions that we perceive. So I don't know if you on the left you observe that the 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 circle on the left side here is if the circle looks smaller to you than the circle on the right. Um, if, if you see that illusion, so a lot of people see it, uh, that's a, a, an artifact of how our brain processes the images. And here it's a, a lot of people would perceive this and I perceive it as a spiral, even though each, each uh, line here is actually a circle. So again, this is a, a artifact of how our brain processes visual information. These particular type of artifacts, and there's a few more, um, when you, we train neural networks, uh, some, of, or some of these artifacts, not all of them, uh, show up in how the neural network processes the world. So it's gonna have similar biases or similar um, illusions as we have. So it's a, um, this is the concept of metamers where uh, different uh, stimuli, different inputs into a network uh, generate the same kind of um, output. So, or in this case, it'd be kind of this, this is the same input, but it generates kind of different outputs. Um, and it's it, in order to uh, be efficient at computation, we are uh, abstracting certain features of the image that uh, in the end, probably we are, we shouldn't abstract because if we do abstract them, we, we have these illusions where we think uh, similar things are different and then different things are similar. Um, and the idea here with the moment of Zen is that if we understand neural networks and how they operate at the edge cases better, would we be able to understand how the human uh, mind also operates? Um, there's, there's, I put links here if you guys want to learn more about this. This is a video on, on how these uh, neural networks were developed to evaluate how their illusions map on the human illusions. There's a link here also about um, how we perceive reality and uh, what that tells us about kind of the, what, what is the underlying reality? Can we say anything about that? Um, and 
how we evolve to perceive reality. Okay, so this is about it for now. Um, we'll we'll take a, a break. Uh, whoops. Oh man, how does this happen? So we'll take a 15 minute break. Um, I'll be I'll be on Discord to help you guys with Lab Five. Uh, I just want to say for Lab Five, um, there's a short video. It's a five minute video that describes um, in how how the instructions should be interpreted. Um, I think a lot of people kind of jumped in. Um, in the lab without reading the full instruction set. So it was, uh, they, they found themselves a bit lost. So I created a five minute video to just walk you through the lab. Uh, okay, so we'll take, a, a, let's say 15 minute break. So at three o'clock, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll join you guys on Discord. That'll help you with lab five. And I've noticed that there's a few of you that haven't finished uh, lab three and four. Uh, and I'll be there to help you guys. So just come to Discord, I'll help you. Uh, I think next next week um, for the lab class, we'll, we'll probably do it in person. We'll do the lecture online, but for the class, um, for the lab, we'll, we'll do it in person. So I'll be there to help you guys in person. Um, all right, so that's about it for this week. Hopefully uh, you guys are okay and we can, we can we'll work on the lab.